You know, oftentimes I hear people say like, you know, I'm never going to keep up with those sharks on Wall Street. It's a, it's a waste of time. Th that's completely untrue. The average guy actually has a huge advantage, but there's various techniques that you can use to beat the market. Um, if you're patient and you're an independent thinker and you don't have to be worried about what your boss thinks or what your client thinks, you don't have to be out there buying, buying, selling to, to create turnover and make your clients happy you see that you're doing something you can just wait for the perfect investment and then and then pounce welcome everyone my name is alexander mccobin i'm a general partner at liberty ventures and this is the liberty ventures podcast i'm really excited to be talking today with my good friend alec green and to provide a little bit of background alec is the chief investment strategist of the oxford club and a primary contributor to liberty through wealth he has more than three decades of experience as an investment analyst, portfolio manager, and financial writer. He directs a monthly financial newsletter, the Oxford Communique, along with three specialized trading services, the Insider Alert, the Momentum Alert, and Oxford Micro Crap micro cap trader. <laughs> I hope that wasn't a Freudian. <laughs> I think story. we're going to have to we're going to have to edit that one out. <laughs> okay. uh, Alex is also the best selling author of four books, The Gone Fishing Portfolio, The Secret of Shelter Island, Beyond Wealth, and An Embarrassment of Riches and is just incredibly knowledgeable, not only about capitalism and investing, but really about entrepreneurship as a result through all of that, too. Alec, thank you so much for taking the time out of Freedom Fest to come and talk with us. Today. Alexander, thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. So. I want to start by just giving everyone who's listening a little bit of context for how you got to where you are today and this impressive bio that you have. Right. So would you be willing to actually just share your story with us about what's led to what you're doing today and why this is how you're spending right. your life? OK, well, I, I guess I should start out as a young man. I uh, like most young men, I was essentially broke had a, a net worth of approximately zero, but was fascinated by money and the fact that money gives you choices to live the life you want to live. You can live in the neighborhood you want. You can spend your time the way you want. You can uh, do the things you want. And if you don't have money, you're so constricted as, as to having those choices. And so uh, I got into the money manager business in 1985. And I've worked as a, as a uh, investment analyst, a portfolio manager, and a financial writer for the last 37 years. Uh, and in my time on Wall Street, uh, I learned a lot about how wealth is built and created and expanded. Um, but, you know, everybody you work with on Wall Street is already wealthy for the most part. I mean, the, the assets are under management are the, are the key to making money on Wall Street. So nobody wants the small accounts. Nobody wants the ordinary people. And so I was just dealing primarily with ultra rich people who wanted to be even richer. And so 23 years ago, I left that job to write full time about the markets with the Oxford Club. I'm the chief investment strategist there. And I'm trying to show people how they can achieve financial independence and live the life of their dreams by following proven principles of, of saving, investing, and compounding their money. And so that's what I devote most of my time to now. So there's so much in that I want to dig into, but let's start with the transition from Wall Street to what you're doing right now. So can you say a little bit more about how thinking about accumulating more wealth when you're already wealthy is different from people who maybe have a little bit of wealth already and are looking to grow that even more? Right. Um, well, I should begin by saying that the transition started from the fact that I was with a small firm to start and I wrote all of our research reports and all of our client communications and I found that I really enjoyed researching and, and writing about the markets more than I like just talking to clients on the phone all the time. So that was a part of it. But also I found that most people don't really understand how the economy works or how the financial markets work. And they it's just not a part of a, of a high school education. People, people graduate from high school. They don't know what compound interest is or a 401k or an adjustable rate mortgage. Uh, and then they go to college and then their professors teach them that we live in this unfortunate economic system called capitalism. It's based on greed and selfishness and exploitation. Um, and it's simply uh, a massive mischaracterization. And let me let me sort of unpack that for you a little bit. Look, let's think about this. Is capitalism about greed and selfishness and exploitation? Well, let's let's start with greed. Are there some people for whom there is no amount that's enough? I guess there's some those people are out there. But even if you're the greediest person in the world, no one is going to give you a dime until you provide a, a service or a product or labor that's of value to them. So, so being greedy does it can't make you rich. You've, you've got to be oriented toward other people's needs. Um, so, how about selfishness? Well, you know, we're all uh, rationally self-interested, and that's the foundation of an economic <clears throat> system like capitalism, which makes it 
anti-fragile because self-interest is something that is universal. But you don't get rich by thinking about yourself. You get rich by thinking about other people. What do they want? What do they need? How can I get it to them better, faster, cheaper than, than someone out there now? Um, so it, it's not about selfishness, but selflessness. How can I help other people? Uh, I, I often say that uh, capitalism, it means you can have anything you want if you just help other people get the things that they want. So that, that's the beautiful part of it. Uh, exploitation, okay? Well, everything in a capitalistic system is voluntary. If you don't want to work for a company, you don't have to work for them. If you don't want to accept their wages or benefits, you don't have to. If you don't want to shop at a company, you don't have to. If you don't want to supply a company, you don't have to. If you don't want to own their shares, you don't have to. There's no, there's no exploitation there. You know, com contrast that with government, which is all about coercion. Everything is either required or forbidden, and, and there's no voluntary aspect to it at all. So, so people have got the wrong idea about capitalism. Uh, it's the greatest anti-poverty program and greatest wealth creation system of all time. And it's really a shame that more Americans <clears throat> or people generally don't understand uh, how the capitalistic system works and why it's so successful at creating wealth. So, of course, I'm inclined to agree with you on all that and that more people generally should understand the principles of capitalism. But I want to dig into how you apply that to your investment analysis, because I think there are some direct applications there. But I'm really curious to hear if you're applying these principles to the newsletters you write, to the advice that you're giving. And if so, how do you apply them? To right. That? Well, it, start, it starts with understanding a bit, a bit of history. If you look over time, like the, the U.S. economy is, is eight times larger than it was when I was born. The stock market is many times higher than when I was born. You can see that you, you shouldn't be following the headlines, which are always scary because that attracts listeners and viewers and website visits and so on, clicks. Um, and so you need to be oriented toward the fact that um, we live in, a, in an age of increasing prosperity. Uh, and you can take advantage of that prosperity as an investor. And I often say <clears throat> that we live, we're living in a golden age for investors right now. Because I've been doing this for so long, I can tell you how the landscape has been totally transformed uh, in the investment world. For instance, that there's never been more choices. There's more, more stocks and bonds and, and mutual funds and ETFs and other vehicles uh, to choose from than ever before. Um, commissions and minimums had never been lower. For, for a, lot of, a lot of places, even big companies like Schwab uh, and E-Trade and so on, there's no minimal investment and, there, and there's zero commissions. I mean, when, when I started off, people would pay hundreds and sometimes thousands of dollars to make a trade. That doesn't exist anymore. Um, you have uh, thinner spreads, bid-ask spreads in stocks. <clears throat> That's the, you know, the, the, the ask is the price you pay, the bid is the price you'd receive if you were selling. It used to be it was a quarter of a point on big stocks, uh, or excuse me, eighth of a point, which is 12 and a half cents, and a quarter of a point on smaller stocks. Now it's a penny. And they're going to fractions of a penny. So, so again, that money used to go to the market makers. Now it stays in the investor's pocket. Um, trade execution's never been faster. When I started on Wall Street, I would talk to my clients on the phone. They'd place an order. I'd write it up by hand. I'd put them on hold. I'd walk down to the trading desk. and then Now, of course, you, you click a button on your computer and zip, you're in. Again, zero, no commission, you're in. Z click sell, you're out. I mean, co compare that to a real estate closing. You know, buying and selling stocks is so easy so uh, frictionless uh, and, and uh, monitoring your portfolio has never been easier. It used to be you had to go down and look at the ticker tape at the brokerage firm or <laughs> wait for tomorrow's <laughs> newspaper to come out to see what the stocks did. Now, now you can watch your portfolio in real time. So, so we're living at a time where capitalism uh, is not appreciated. And oftentimes I hear people say like, you know, I'm never going to I'm never going to keep up with those sharks on Wall Street. It's a, it's a waste of time. That, that's completely untrue. Three out of four active money managers can't beat their benchmark each year. Over a period of 10 years or more, 95% of them can't. So the, the average guy actually has a huge advantage. He doesn't have any conflicts of interest like Wall Street does. He doesn't have to be worrying about the quarterly report, whether he's going to keep his job or lose it. Um, you can be patient and you can, uh, you can take advantage of all these great situations. And there's various techniques that I use. I'd be happy to talk about those, but, but there's various techniques that you can use to beat the market um, if you're patient and you're an independent thinker and you don't have to be worried about what your boss thinks or what your client thinks. Or as, as Warren Buffett says, as an individual investor, you can sit there and just wait for the perfect pitch. You don't have to be out there buying, buying, selling to, to create 
turnover and make your clients happy, you see that you're doing something, you can just wait for the perfect investment and then, and then pounce. So I do want to dig into those techniques, and I am curious how much these principles of capitalism play into that. You know, for the Liberty Ventures ecosystem, building aligned investors and entrepreneurs committed to advancing a free and prosperous future, we're more focused on the angel investing side of things, and we're looking at startups, early stage companies. And I see so many ways of applying the principles of capitalism that you talked about before to that early investing stage. When we're diligencing founders, we're asking ourselves, Okay, are they trying to solve a problem for their customers or are they just focused on themselves? That gets to your distinction between being selfish or being selfless. Right. We're also looking to see if they really do want to solve a problem in the world or if they are just trying to get rich and don't really care about the company. Yeah. Because that means they probably don't have the passion to see this through and turn into something really successful. Right. Are you applying that same kind of thinking to the public markets, though, or would you? how else would you apply that to the well, early stage space? Well, I, I have... I've got a friend, we've got a mutual friend, John Mackey, who's the founder and former CEO of Whole Foods. He retired last year. And he wrote a beautiful book called Conscious Capitalism. And he tried to point out that if, if you're just trying to get rich at the expense of other people, that, that it's not going to work. Because think about this. If you, if you undervalue your employees, they'll take their talents elsewhere. If you overcharge your customers, they won't become repeat customers and won't refer people to them. If you drive too hard a bargain with your suppliers, then they're not going to trade with you. Uh, you if you have to take care of the people, uh, everybody, the customers, the suppliers, the employees, the community, it's by making everybody happy that you make the most money. So uh, again, the, the, the old Bernie Sanders uh, trope that, uh, you know, it, it's all about paying people as little as possible and charging people as much as possible. I mean, yes, you, as a, a shareholder or an owner of a business, your, your job is to maximize profits. Find the point at which people will be willing to pay, they won't be paid more, and you can't, you can't make as much if you've charged them less. That is, again, it's voluntary. The customers are saying, I like the product, I like the service, I think the quality is good. Um, I, I like everything about the way you execute your business, and I'm going to remain a, 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 not just a, a loyal customer, but a raving fan and send you uh, referrals. So I look for companies like that because I know they're doing the right thing. There is there is no conflict between maximizing profits and treating everybody well. I can tell you, um, if, if with the Oxford Club, for instance, we have a lot of great, young, dedicated people working for us. We know if they're not happy with their compensation, with their benefits, they're going to look around and see where else they could be working. So, so it's it's not about just just you know dealing as harshly as you can with everybody because those businesses don't succeed. You've you've got to find the point at which your employees are happy, your suppliers are happy, your customers are happy, and then when you see the bottom line, you'll be happy. 100%, which I think is incredibly valuable advice for entrepreneurs So when they're thinking about how to build their business. It's not about being ruthless. It's actually about giving as much as possible to all of your stakeholders, to your employees, to your investors, to your customers, so that they want to keep building this business up and they want to see you succeed. Right. That's I'll, what it's about. I'll, I'll tell you something else. I've, I've become good friends with uh, Bill O'Reilly over the years, and he's done uh, an excellent job of, of even doing promotions for, for the Oxford Club and me. And one of the things he told me over dinner one night is, when you have a business, he goes, and what, he goes, when I do my show, I'm trying to give people something they can't get anywhere else. And so I would think as an entrepreneur, yeah, you're in an industry, you're in a sector where people are doing a lot of the same things, but what are you doing that nobody else is doing? Either, either the product's got to be better or it's got to be cheaper or you can deliver it faster or you can better, give a better warranty. You've got to be doing something that really clearly differentiates you from everyone else. And if you've ever watched the program Shark Tank, these sharks, these billionaires and other successful entrepreneurs, they take apart everybody's business plan and they say, what are you doing that's different? What are you doing that's unique? How, how can you protect your profit margins? You, you gotta have either a trademark or a brand name or a copyright or something that can, because people are out there looking at what everyone's doing and if they see someone's doing something that's making a lot of money, they wanna come in and copy it, but they can't copy it if you, if you, you know, you can't go out and sell Coca-Cola. You, Coca-Cola owns the brand name. You, can, you can't create a new phone that uses the Apple operating system because that's patented by Apple. And so you do want to have something that makes you unique. And uh, uh, Warren Buffett refers this to businesses having a moat around them. You know, if you, if, if you have those types of things that protect profit margins, then you've got a secure business. And if you look at businesses that went, that, that failed, 
Montgomery Wards lasted for 100 years before it went out of business. Radio Shack, Circuit City, Borders, what do all these companies have in common? They didn't have anything that differentiated them. I mean, anybody can sell books, and then when Amazon came along, there was no reason for Borders, and Barnes & Noble was doing it better. Circuit City, Radio Shack, selling electronics, and Best Buy came along, online retailers came along. You've got to find something that you're doing, a niche, uh, where you're doing something that no one else is doing, and you've got to have a way to protect your sales and earnings. 100%. Now, we probably should have actually explained from the outset, I, Liberty Ventures largely works, as I said, in the private markets with angel investing. The advice that you give to your readers, I don't think is in that area. But correct me no. if I'm wrong on that. No, I, I, because I'm everyone I'm talking to is looking to invest their money in publicly traded stocks and bonds. So we're not doing private equity. We're not doing private placements. Um, it's, it's so let me ask open everybody, what, what, how do you generally think about the, about these two different approaches to investing? Do you strongly prefer the public side or do you think there's a place for the angel investing private equity in a diverse portfolio for people? As oh, well? no, there's there's definitely a place for it. It's just not something that I, I specialize in myself. You know, what happens is an entrepreneur comes up with a good idea or a business plan. Um, he needs money. Uh, he has had enough experience to turn oftentimes to the public markets, you know, investment banks not going to fund a startup. You need venture capitalists, angel investors to come in and do that. Um, so that, those are how businesses go from great ideas to, to great companies is right there at the very beginning. And the funding generally comes from the private sector. And then uh, the private investors cash out when a company does an IPO in a few years, usually at a multiple to the price that the angel investors and uh, private equity investors got in. Um, my, my good friend, Dan Butner, the Blue Zones guy, uh, he offered me a friends and family entrance uh, into, he's got a new uh, Blue Zones longevity foods he's come out with. Blue Frozen Zones foods. Kitchen, yeah, very but, interesting company. Yeah. So he offered me an opportunity to take uh, part in that, and I am. And, and the, the idea is that, yeah, I, I, I've already tried the test product with him and so on, and I believe it's, I mean, he says he's <clears throat> maniacally focused on delicious, which is which is great when you think about it. It's, it's not just about living longer, which is what Blue Zones, for those viewers who don't uh, aren't familiar with Dan Butner, Dan Butner is a National Geographic fellow who around, went around the world and identified the, place, the places that had the longest lived peoples. People routinely became centenarians, lived to 100 or more. So it's Okinawa, Japan, and Sardinia, Italy and places in Costa Rica and so on. And what he found is that those people had very healthy ways of eating, they exercised regularly, had close family connections. <clears throat> so he's taken the, the Blue Zones brand and he's sold a number of best-selling books, but he also has created these foods. And I, I took a trip with Dan and John uh, down to Nevis one time. When we came back at the airport, he had the staff all there set up with the foods and we, we tried each one of the frozen foods they're coming out with. And I'm not kidding you. They were delicious. If I was in a hurry and just wanted something nutritious and tasty to eat, and so when Dan came to me and said, "Hey, I'm I'm raising some money in a, um, a private placement," I said, "Yeah, absolutely, count me in." And uh, the idea is that someday we'll go public and at a at a big multiple to where the private investors got in. So. I think we should probably include some caveat in here that we are not giving financial advice. We're not telling people to make any particular investments. Yeah. Obviously, this is entertainment purposes, right. but it's a great the Blue Zones Kitchen is a great example of the kind of early stage opportunities that are out there that we're diligencing as well right now. Right. And I, I'm curious, since you do so much work with the public <laughs> markets, but you also do angel investing yourself, do you look at those investments in different ways? And if so, how? Well, uh, the private uh, investments are, are tend to be more speculative. Uh, they tend to be less liquid. You know, if, if I if I buy IBM and I decide next week I need that money back, I can sell IBM at market. Um, you don't have the liquidity, uh, so you have you have to show a little patience. You have to be willing to set the money aside for a while. Um, you have to have some conviction that that uh, the people that you're uh, investing with are good people and that the product is genuinely something new and different. Um, and in this case, of course, uh, uh, the brand name, you know, Blue Zones is something people can't duplicate and, and it's becoming well known. It's going to become better known because Dan's doing a, uh, a four part Netflix series that's coming out in a few weeks. And so people will be even more aware of the Blue Zones brand. But unfortunately, your viewers couldn't invest in Blue Zones anyway. That was just a, a private placement for friends and family. But but I'm just saying that those those opportunities do exist. The the publicly traded investments are much more liquid. You're buying individual stocks or bonds or mutual funds or ETFs. Um, you have instant liquidity. Um, they're generally more conservative because they're companies that have been around for a while. Many of them pay dividends. 
Um, uh, whereas with startups, you're usually dealing with people who are very early, the sales are there, but the earnings are not. Um, and generally with stocks, uh, the earnings have come along. Although I will say, if you look at some of the best performing stocks of the last 20 years, they were companies that had fast growing sales, but no earnings. I mean, Amazon fell in that category, Netflix in that category, uh, Tesla. These are all companies that were growing really fast, but had not made one dime. But, it, but people could see it coming. They, they could see the sales rising and they knew that the costs were under control and that eventually the, it would spill over and you'd have net profits and that those net profits would grow sharply. And indeed, um, I own those stocks and they've, they've worked out very well for investors. Okay, so now let's get to those techniques that you mentioned earlier that you often recommend <clears throat> okay. for investors for how to do well in the public market. Okay, uh, I, I have very conservative strategies because some people are conservative investors and I have more aggressive strategies. Let me, let me start with conservative. You can look at, the, at a long-term graph of the stock market and see that while there's all kinds of things, there's recessions and war and natural disasters and bolts out of the blue like 9-11 uh, and the financial crisis and the pandemic and things that come along, over time, share prices go up. Uh, over time, the economy grows. And of course, it's not government that provides us with the food and clothing and shelter and medicine. It's private companies competing uh, to maximize profits. So you can do something conservative like buying an index fund, or I even wrote a book called The Gone Fishing Portfolio, where I recommended a, a portfolio of 10 index funds. You do nothing but spend 20 minutes once a year to rebalance those funds. And the rest of the time you, you go fishing, you do whatever you want to do. That's a very conservative strategy and it's worked well. We, uh, I've had the portfolio for 20 years. It's matched the return of the S&P 500. It hasn't beaten the S&P, but it's 30% bond. So it's a whole lot less risk than being fully invested in stocks and the return just as much. So that's, that's a success story. Then with individual stocks, I always tell people, if you're gonna trade individual stocks, I mean, I, I've bought and held companies that I'm a raving fan of, like companies like Apple and Amazon and Netflix, because I, I like the product and I just bought and held them, not just for years, but for decades, and those have worked out well. But you can also make money trading short term. But people should be aware that if you're trading short term, you're going up against the smartest, most experienced people with access to people with advanced degrees in mathematics and the latest technology and, and algorithms that, that uh, are incredibly sophisticated. So what, what are you as an individual investor, what are you gonna do to, to beat these people that have all these advantages over you? And I've got one very good answer and that is nothing can beat inside information, okay? Now, trading on inside information is illegal. However, insiders, these are the officers and directors that actually oversee a company, they have access to all sorts of material, non-public information about the future prospects of the business, and they can hardly forget that information when they go in the market to trade their own company shares. And uh, obviously in a free market system, you can't prevent people who own, work for a company from trading their own company shares. And so the compromise that the government came up with, because they clearly have an unfair advantage, is that they have to file what's called a Form 4 with the SEC, detailing how many shares of their own company bought at what price and on what date, and that makes it apparent to the rest of us that they're buying their own company shares. And so when I see an insider who's buying millions or tens of millions, or in, in one case with Dustin Moskovitz of Asana last year, he bought one and a half billion dollars of his own company shares in the open market. It's a very good signal because the insiders know the direction of sales since the last quarterly report. They know about the new products and services and development. They know about um, what the company has gained or lost any key customers or is about to. They know about the threat or the instigation or the settlement of any outstanding litigation against the company. Um, they, they, or whether somebody's thinking about taking the company private or they're receiving any unsolicited takeover bids. So, and they know everything positive and negative that can be known about the company's employees, suppliers, customers, competitors. And so they are the most knowledgeable people. And so I've been able to beat the market on a pretty consistent basis by simply riding the coattails of these knowledgeable insiders. Again, mm. it becomes public information. I can see how many shares they bought, at what price, at what date. And I can also go back and research through history if they bought their own company shares in the past. And if they did, did they buy them low and sell them high? And if they sit on the board of other companies, did they buy those shares and sell them? And what kind of track record do they have? What's the size of the transaction? Big transactions mean more conviction that the shares are undervalued. Um, and so this is just one technique that I use 
um, to gain an edge because, again, as I mentioned earlier, you have to offer people something they're not getting somewhere else. I, I talk to people all the time. They own a portfolio of stocks. They have no idea whether the insiders are buying or selling or doing nothing or whether the insiders even own any of their own company shares. Um, and so I'm trying to give people something they can't get anywhere else. Uh, and I'm trying to make sure that they can uh, develop a net worth that allows them to live their life uh, the way that they choose, which is really what, what capitalism is about, is, is you can follow, have the life of your dreams if you have the money to make the choices to give you the quality of life that you want. And that's, that's what I try to help them with. I think that's fantastic. And there's such a direct application to entrepreneurs as well, not just in the public market, because it, it, reminds, it should remind anyone listening that investors and people who are thinking about supporting your company are looking to see how invested you are in it yourself. Are you looking to give up control? Are you looking to prioritize other things? Or are you throwing everything that you have into this? Because that says you're committed to it. You see the potential for success here. And so is just as applicable to the private market as the public market, I would say. Right. I, I would agree with that. And I, I think it's important to deal with people who really know the industry that they're working with. Like I, I've, again, spent 37 years doing this. Um, I, when I retired from Wall Street 23 years ago, I was already financially independent, but I, I thought it would, it would be fun to share what I've learned and help other people become financial. But I'm, I'm sure you're feeling the same way. You'd like to show other people what you've learned, how they can achieve some of the things that you've achieved. Um, because I, I, I have friends who ask me all the time, you've, you've got plenty of money. Why don't you just quit, play golf, travel, whatever? I, I would be bored to death. I, I, I need to have an, some kind of intellectual challenge to keep me keep me moving ahead. And uh, to me, I'm, I'm one of those weird people that the, the financial markets are completely fascinating because everything that's happening in the world <laughs> shows up not just in, 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 in the private markets, but in the public markets. Think about this. Uh, you have business developments. You have scientific innovation that's affecting stock prices, interest rates, currency fluctuations, commodity prices, geopolitical situations like what's happening in Ukraine. Um, New legislation, both uh, pending and existing, regulations, taxes, uh, politics, uh, uh, everything. It's, it's like a giant Rubik's Cube. And I, just, I think it's fascinating to look at what's happening and try to determine the best way to invest your money. And it's funny, I was, I was coming back from the airport the other day and I was in an Uber uh, and the, the driver asked me, he goes, what do, you, what do you do? And I said, well, uh, I write about the financial markets. And the, and the guy said, he asked a very basic question, but what, but what was so... Apropos, he goes, he goes, how do you know what the economy or the stock market is going to do ahead of time? And I said, I said, that's a great question. And the answer is nobody knows. Nobody knows what the economy is going to do. Nobody knows what the stock market is going to do. And that's what makes it such a fascinating challenge. I always say, count yourself a sophisticated investor the day you can say, since no one can tell me what the economy or the stock market is going to do, how should I run my money? And the way to do it is to, is, I always say, it's, it's the magic of thinking small. Rather than trying to figure out the whole world, well, so-and-so gets elected, and if the Fed does this, and if the war in Ukraine turns into that, I mean, that's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're, you're thinking way too big. Think, think bottom up. Find a company, and this, this is so appropriate to uh, private businesses. Find a company that's doing all the right things. It's increasing sales. It's compounding earnings. It's cutting costs. It's refinancing debt. It's gaining customers. It's gaining market share. Think, think about those things from the bottom up and forget about figuring out the whole world because most of us are not macroeconomists. We're not political pundits. We're not geopolitical strategists. And, uh, and it's crazy to run your portfolio based on all these big picture ideas that nobody has the answer to. And of course, you can be paid a lot of money to go on TV and talk like you have the answer to these things, but nobody has the answers truly. And so it, it, I, I, I say um, being a successful investor starts with having what I call epistemic humility. I don't know what inflation is going to be. I don't know what the Fed is going to do. I don't know whether we're going to have a recession and I don't know what the stock market is going to do. So now let's roll up our sleeves and start putting our money to work the safest and most profitable way that we can. I love that, Alec. I, I want to respect your time and respect our listeners time. And so we're going to be wrapping this up now. But the question I want to end here with, because you've shared so much great advice already is to, and to provide context, 
I always believe in people giving <laughs> first. It's like we were talking about with entrepreneurs. They need to be able to give as much value to others as possible and the rewards and the returns will come to them and encourage more people to offer to give in order to get what they want down the line. So for anyone who's listening, if they wanted to be able to give you something, if there was something they wanted to work with you and they wanted to just volunteer to help you with anything else that would be valuable for you, what would it be? Are you talking about helping my organization or helping the world become a better place? Either one. Um, well, I would say, first of all, you could, you could visit uh, the oxygenclub.com if you've got some skills that you think you, can, you could bring to our organization and help us out as a researcher or a writer or a marketer. We'd be happy to, to deal with you. I do feel very much that it's important to, to give. I don't say give back because give back means it, it implies that you took something that wasn't yours. I, I think it's important to give. And uh, I'm, I'm proud to say that one of the organizations that I've been giving to recently is Students for Liberty. And I've, I, I, it's an organization that I feel really strongly about. They take uh, young college students and teach them the principles of liberty, help them become entrepreneurs, help them become the leaders of tomorrow. And I've, I've been telling my own uh, Oxford Club readers that if you've been giving money to your alma mater, for instance, I mean, it's an easy thing to do. You love the school. You want your kids to go there, even your grandkids. You root for the football and basketball team. It's easy to give money. But some of these schools, they're, they're anti-freedom. You know, they're deplatforming speakers. They, they foster a cancer culture and safe spaces and just try to shut down free speech. And that's the exact opposite of what Students for Liberty is about. And so I've been encouraging my own readers to take some of that money that they've been given to their alma mater and direct it to Students for Liberty where they can make a positive change in the world. What, what more positive step could you take than to educate people in the principles of political and economic freedom, train them to go out and put those principles to work uh, in the private market and in the public markets um, to make the world a better, freer, more prosperous place? I love both of those, obviously. I think it's fantastic for people to support Students for Liberty, and I think it would be great for them to offer any, anything they can do to create value for the Oxford Club, because that is capitalism right there. It's them offering value, knowing that they will get a return if they're able to do so for you. Absolutely. Again, thank you for taking the time out of Freedom Fest. It was a great conversation with you, and look forward to having you on again in the future. I enjoyed it, Alexander. Thanks so much. I look forward to doing it again. You're here. Thank you.